We're in that portion of our study tonight where you might say part two. Part two, the division between the church, or Israel and the church and the Gentile. I don't think I originally said it that way. I think I said Israel, uh, the Gentile, and the church of God. This would be number what? Four? Yes. Number four. Last week we were rightly dividing scriptures to show the prophecy of Israel. And of course we ended with just a couple more that I should have uh, brought to you. But uh, the Bible, after we had gone through the Bible on many scriptures to show that they as a nation... God's going to turn their back upon them because of their sins. And we'll see that later on in the New Testament. And then later on he will bring them back from their dispersions all throughout the world and all the nations. And uh, then they will look upon Christ at, at his second coming. We saw that last week. There will be a nation born in a day. So I'll take up there tonight in Isaiah chapter 66 just to quickly finish up this section of uh, speaking of rightly dividing Israel from everyone else. So in Isaiah 66, in ch chapter 66 and verse 8, we read this verse of Scripture. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Now this is a scripture in reference to, it's a, it's a Old Testament prophecy of the nation of Israel becoming a nation in one day. And when they do, do you all remember when they came out of Egypt how God allowed them to take the riches of Egypt out with them, all the gold and everything? When they become a nation again one day, they will take all the rich, they'll bring forth all the riches of the Gentiles. Uh, turn with me just a few chapters back, Isaiah chapter 60. And beginning in verse 9, surely the isles, that means all the other nations, surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel because he hath glorified thee. And also one chapter over, six to chapter 61 and verse 6. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory ye shall boast yourselves. Now, of course, these scriptures speak of them coming back where the nation is born in one day. And... Uh, they then go into the millennial kingdom of the Lord. Now, when they get into the uh, uh, kingdom of the Lord, they're going to then accept the royal grant that was given them, which was the land. They have never really received all of the land. <clears throat> the royal grant, and we won't uh, give you but just... Uh, two dimensions of it and let you go home and read the rest of the dimensions because that takes up a lot of scripture. But turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 and beginning in verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now the river of Egypt in this prophecy is the Nile River and not that little Waddell just uh, 
east of that that's named the River of Egypt. I remember some years ago when I was teaching this, I had people would take issue with me saying, now, wait a minute, the map says points to a little canal. <laughs> it's a little Waddell. Just a little bit of water that is probably uh, just uh, on the map, it's, you know, probably 20, 30 miles east of the Nile, maybe 50 miles, I don't really recall how far. And it's called the River of Egypt. But you see, this was named, this little uh, area, this little Waddell, or what we would call a canal, was named that many, many years after this prophecy here. And it was named by man. So you can't redraw the boundary lines that God originally drew. The ri river of Egypt to, to God was the River Nile. And so the River Nile, all the way over to the River Euphrates. <coughs> Uh, that is east and that is west. And that desert in between the Euphrates and the promised land one day will not be desert anymore. It will all be fertile land during the millennium. Now there is a northern boundary and a southern boundary also, but you have to pick that out in a lot of scripture. But if you go home and read Ezekiel 48, 1 through 29, you'll get the northern and the southern boundary from Hamath, northeast of Damascus, to Kadesh on the south. will be in those scriptures. 1 through 29. I want to save that time of reading 29 verses of scripture. <laughs> So it's quite a, a big uh, uh, portion of Scripture. Now, <clears throat> in Ezekiel, he also divides up the land so that we can understand what, uh, what each tribe receives. And he gives you uh, the uh, surveyor's report, so to speak. Just like a person being surveying a piece of property, it's all in Ezekiel, 40th chapter on, you know. And you can find out what each tribe, how much land they're going to get. It's already been prophesied. You got, it's also there is a prince's portion in the middle. There is a place where there's a Levite's portion. And then there are 12 portions that are given to the 12 tribes of Israel. Perhaps as we go on in this study, I can come and kind of draw you a map of that. All right, now as we talk about Israel again, <clears throat> before leaving it, remember that there are a series, not a series, but several covenants that God made and is in this Old Testament. Now before Israel was, of course, became a nation, there was a covenant to Noah, the Noahic covenant. And that covenant was sealed with certain promises like I'll, I put a rainbow in the sky to show that I'll never cause the world to flood again and so forth and so forth. So there's a noetic covenant. <clears throat> when we come to Israel <clears throat> with, the, with the first one, that is, that is Abraham, God made an Abrahamic covenant. And this is unconditional. And its counterpart to the church is, you see, that moment that you become born again. That covenant is a covenant of grace to Israel, whereas under the church it's a covenant. It's not a covenant. It is grace. Now, I want you to always remember this because you can get confused. We've got to rightly divide what we're supposed to rightly divide. Uh, conjunctions. Let them stay apart, subjunctions, let them come together. Or, or the opposite, conjunctions come together, I guess. And subjunctions are apart. Uh, never uh, never uh, uh, understand, never... Uh, let's see what's the word I'm trying to choose here. Uh, never in all the New Testament does God use the word covenant for the church. He had never made a covenant with the church. The word covenant is always used in relationship to Israel. 
Now I hear someone saying, but the New Testament, the word New Testament means New Covenant. <clears throat> yes, that may be, but is in relationship to show the difference between the Old Covenant as, a, as, as opposed to the New Covenant, which he will really bring on to Israel, and it's brought out in Hebrews, where a new covenant he will make with them. So we call this the New Testament. But as far as a covenant, him coming to the church and saying, if you will do this, here is a covenant I will make with you. The word covenant is never used. Only with Israel. There's a covenant it was made with Abraham. Abraham believed and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. What did he believe? He believed God's word. What did God say? I'm going to give you a son. Abraham, you see, as was at a point in his life when he finally, when this finally crystallized, you know, in his mind, even though he had faith before, he was trying to help God with it a little bit, but when he finally gave up and just trusted God, and he gave him this son. And in his thinking, he understood then that he was not supposed to try to help God and uh, have children by with another woman. It had to be between him and uh, his wife, Sarah, or Sarai at that time. Now, that covenant cannot be, uh, that's unconditional. He didn't have to do a thing but believe. And his son, of course, was Isaac, but there was... He was the seed, but there was a greater son that would come out of Isaac, and that would be the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what he was looking toward. And Abraham believed that, and they always, he constantly was looking forward for the coming Messiah all down through the history of the Jews. Now, later on, after a nation was formed out of Abraham, a nation of people, they came out of, Egypt and when God gave them that law he then they became his people or a nation of people and he was going to move now move them now into the land as a nation of people now he makes another covenant called the Mosaic covenant the Mosaic covenant is conditional and uh, the Mosaic Covenant just simply says, if you will keep my commandments, you know, you hear what I say and you obey, you keep my commandments. It says, I'll make you a peculiar people. So there was a, there was a Mosaic, there was a covenant given, and if they did that, then they would get something. Now, two main covenants <clears throat> to, the, uh, to the children of Israel, one through Abraham, which was the, covenant of grace that they all were saved from if they all believed the same as Abraham was uh, believed individually and nationally too for the whole nation was looking for this Messiah to come and the second one was conditional if you obey me then you'll be a peculiar people now we have that same thing with the church we have the con we have the first uh, the counterpart of that uh, Abrahamic covenant, but it's not a covenant. It's just grace. He who believes on Jesus Christ is saved. It's unconditional. You don't have to do anything. And also, we have another uh, thing that uh, another thing that God has given to us. We spoke of it Sunday as the gift and the prize. Now we come up to the prize part. <laughs> And uh, that speaks of if we are obedient to him, continuous. <laughs> if we're pleasing unto him, continuous. Uh, then, you know, he will give us uh, a reward. Now, we see this in many different ways. Remember Romans uh, chapter 8. Verse 17 along there where we're not only heirs of God but joint heirs with Christ if so be we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. That's that second uh, counterpart of the covenant that uh, was given to Israel. This is the counterpart to the uh, Mosaic covenant. 
if you hear my words and you obey me and keep, keep my words, then I will call you a peculiar treasure to Israel. To us, then, you see, you will be, if you're, if, if you're uh, 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 suffering for Christ, then you may also uh, rule and reign with him. So you have those two things. So keep those two covenants apart. So many people want to make the Abrahamic covenant a conditional covenant. It wasn't. It was a covenant of grace. All right, now, that brings us up to speed to tonight. Let me ask you this question. Do you know where the law ended? <laughs> All right, I want to show you something. Turn to Luke 16 and 16. You need to understand this. This is, this is making the rightly dividing something here. And... Uh, Luke chapter 16. Now I'll everybody get it. Now verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. John who? John the Baptist. Or the baptizer, which would probably be a better term. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Now, what he's saying here is that the law and the prophets are in force up until the time that John began to preach. And what did he preach? The kingdom of God. He preached the kingdom of God. What was his message? Does anybody know? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of God is at hand. All right, so the law really ended at the time when John the Baptist began to preach. Now, the message of the kingdom or the gospel of the kingdom was preached uh, by John before the cross and then Jesus came along and began preaching and what did he preach? Same message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn with me. We will look at these things so that we can help, help understand how we get into the church age. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. All right. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Here's John the Baptist's message. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I want, want you to understand what he did not preach. He did not preach, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say that. You see, grace could not be preached at this point because grace hadn't yet, uh, had not yet uh, been crucified on the cross. Does that mean then that people are saved by a different way? No. God saves everyone by grace. He saved Adam by grace. But there is a gospel of grace that is, cannot be preached until after the cross. And this could not be preached to the rest of the people of the world, only to, to, to those of Israel. Because they as a people, as a nation, already belong to God but they had turned their turned and gone their own ways. And uh, the message was to repent, those of you who belong to God, those of you who, of Israel, repent ye, you see, and come back to God, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For the Messiah is about ready to make his appearance. Now, you know, you had to believe the same way as Abraham believed, that the Messiah was coming in order to repent to turn back. <laughs> so the whole nation was to those who already believed. They believed that there was a Messiah. They believed the same thing that uh, Abraham believed, that God would give Abraham uh, a son. In this sense, it's the greater son. There's a lesser son and a greater son. But out of Abraham would come the seed, and that seed would come out through David, and there is, a, by the way, a covenant from David, too, the Davidic covenant. 
that he would sit on the throne of David. That is, his son, which would be the same son of Abraham, would sit upon David's throne. So as a nation, the people already believed, folks. They didn't get saved by repenting and returning. As a nation, they already believed. Individually, we have something else here. Individually, it's something else. A lot of them did not believe. The Pharisees did not believe. There's a lot that did not believe. So individually, they could not repent. Now, if you remember, the Pharisees came to John and he said, I'm not going to baptize you. You go and bring forth fruit, meat for repentance, and then I'll baptize you. You prove that you're believers. All right, so that's what was preached prior to the cross. Now, in Matthew 5, 17, after Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, we see, verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, he's preaching to the Jews. So that was his message. Those that believed did repent, and when they repented, they were baptized. And that's not the same baptism that you and I are baptized with. This is the baptism of repentance. This is John's baptism of repentance, not believers' baptism of following Christ into baptism. He hadn't yet died on the cross. How could they be baptized with his baptism? All right, now we come up to the cross. Jesus is crucified, and now what takes place after the cross? Well, in the early church, before you get to a whole lot of Gentiles, there was nothing but Jews. Now, remember, the Jews individually now is going to get a message of how to be saved. But the message is still going to the Jews. Well, does he switch and then have a gospel of grace? No. Got the same gospel, but it's changed a little bit. We're going to see that. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Matthew 5, 17, and Matthew 3, 2. Yeah, I think it was 4, 17. Was it 4, 17? Oh. All right. I stand corrected. That was 4, 17. All right. Now in Acts chapter 2, you have an account of Peter's first sermon. And uh, we'll begin, uh, I won't read the whole sermon. It won't take that time. But we get to the end of the sermon at the invitation. <laughs> and we go to verse 37. Now when they, who are the they? Jews, right? Any Gentiles there? No. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Pricked in their heart is indicative of believing what he said, or they wouldn't have been pricked in their heart. They wouldn't, have, wouldn't, wouldn't, have, you know, wouldn't have done anything to them. In other words, it means that they believe that what Peter had said in his message, which are these, these verses prior to this, beginning in about uh, uh, verse seventeen. And following on, uh, actually, uh, we get uh, in, more into his message in verse uh, uh, 22. But this is pre Peter preaching here. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, to the rest of, unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now they want to know what to do. Showing again that they believe. They got to do something. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
Now, how many times in my career as pastor hearing, hear, uh, have heard some evangelist or pastor try to use this verse of Scripture to tell a Gentile how to be saved? It's not for Gentiles. It was for Jews who already belonged to it. And first of all, before they could do this, and they had to do something, they had to be pricked in the heart, meaning they had to believe. All right, now, what do you do? You know this is what I say is true. Now, the same thing as I said before the cross, that Jesus preached before the cross, repent. Come back to God, because as a nation, and you member of that nation, you already belong to God. Now that you are a believer, that Jesus was the one who actually died, and that's in his message, see? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That was that was a uh, part of John the Baptist's baptism. He didn't baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. He just baptized them. That was John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. All right, now we have the repentance, and then they're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Or they're saying, we not only repent as a nation and come back to God, but we repent for putting Jesus Christ on the cross, our Messiah. That's all part of that little formula there of what Peter is saying. Now you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right, the gift of the Holy Ghost they had witnessed here while it, just in uh, a few verses before when he came upon the apostles there and they were speaking in tongues. Now when he would, those who would uh, do this, they would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That would be the gift of life, eternal life, as well as the gift of power that they may be used of the Lord. Now, I, I reckon this gift of the Holy Ghost here, though, is really the power of the Holy Spirit in them because I believe that the very moments their hearts were pricked and they believed, they were probably saved. But they had to now do something because they were Jews. And that was repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, that's to the Jews. Let's go to the next time he preached to the Jews. Turn with me to Acts 3, beginning in verse 19. Now, if you have uh, followed, uh, you know, the, the book of Acts here, you'll know that uh, we had Peter and John at the temple, and they, they healed the man that uh, had never walked, and the people were absolutely amazed over it. And then Peter... Uh, said, no, it wasn't us that did it. It was Jesus Christ through us. Beginning in verse 16, And in his name, through faith, in his name hath made this man strong, whom you see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I what that through ignorance ye did it as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, so hath, or he hath so fulfilled. All right, now, now he's preaching to them that they put him on the cross through ignorance. They didn't know who he was. See, these things you did, you did it through ignorance. And this is one of the reasons why God extended the time for Israel as a nation to accept Christ or to trust Christ and to come to, to their Messiah for 40 years. First of all, Jesus prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Secondly, Peter here says, what you did, you did in ignorance. Thirdly, we know that the gospel still went to the Jew up for 40 more years before it went totally to the Gentiles. All right, now what did he say? Verse 19. Here's how you get saved, Jew. See, you Jews. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And uh, here we understand 
that they had to repent, be converted. That mean, means in their repentance, their life would change. They couldn't do that unless they believed, of course. Their sins would be blotted out. That's the same as uh, just saying it a different way than in, in his first sermon. And uh, they'll be all be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And then he shall send Jesus Christ, which uh, before was preached unto you. You see, uh, the kingdom of heaven will occur. You know, it's you know, the kingdom of God is at hand or it, it will occur. It will actually occur when... Uh, he comes back, you crucified, you put him on the cross. Before it was preached that the kingdom of heaven was, was at hand, <clears throat> literally the kingdom was in their midst and they did not recognize him. So they killed him, they put him on the cross. Now he goes back to heaven. And in verse 21 he says, Whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets, since the world began. He says, literally to the Jews, he says, if you'd have gone back and read all this, you'd have seen it. But that's how you get saved. And so this is the gospel of the kingdom, folks. The gospel of grace that you and I are saved under, a totally different gospel. And I, I think I have uh, gone here before many times with you, but for the benefit of the people in the tape ministry, the gospel of the grace is found over in 1 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 15. And do you remember, you'll, you'll do well to remember that the apostle to the Gentiles was Paul. So it would be appropriate, of course, for him to declare it to us what the gospel of grace is. Beginning in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now we have the Spirit, we have the Spirit salvation as well as soul salvation in verse 1 and 2. But here's the gospel of grace, verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he, he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, that's the gospel of grace. If one believes it, he's saved. If he doesn't believe it, he's not saved. Now, coming back to Acts, there were some Gentiles seated in with those Jews. As a matter of fact, we're going to read about three, uh, three Gentiles. The first one is the Ethiopian. So, if you will... Turn with me to Acts chapter 8. We're going to see how the Ethiopian got saved. Now, he's not a Jew. So keep in mind, he has to be saved a different way. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 33, 36, I, I would say. Uh, I will, you know, there's a lot of scripture before this, but, but to make things short, Philip went to the chariot where this Ethiopian was. He was reading in the scriptures about Jesus over in Isaiah. Didn't recognize that Isaiah was speaking about Christ, the coming Messiah that would be uh, slaughtered on the cross as a sheep that was led to slaughter. He, he would die on the cross. And so he asked Philip who, who this was, and Philip opened his mouth, verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same time scripture and preached unto him Jesus all right Isaiah 53 is where he's reading verse 36 and as they went on their way they came unto a certain water and the eunuch said see here is water what doth hinder me to be baptized now this is important folks He'd been trying to be baptized before. He was a proselyte. He had, he had gone to Jerusalem. He had wanted, wanted to be, uh, 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 he, he had wanted to enter into Judaism. 
And Judaism, to be a proselyte, to bring a proselyte into Judaism, that is, they had a way of bringing them in, and one of the one of the rituals that they had to go through was Jewish baptism, which was which was uh, an act that stood for cleansing. <laughs> so he had tried to be a proselyte, and they wouldn't allow him. And the reason for that is because he wasn't perfect man. He was a eunuch, and he'd been operated on. All eunuchs had been operated on because their primary job was to, uh, uh, on a eunuch, was to keep the harems. And so they're operated on. So he had been, as the Jews would say, mutilated. So since he wasn't all there, they wouldn't allow him. So they hindered him. Now he's asked the question, what doth hinder me to be baptized? See, I've been to the Jews, and I'm, I've got a hindrance. What hinders me now? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now that was the gospel of grace that he preached to him because he was a Gentile. He did not tell him to repent first and then he could be baptized. All right, that's the first Gentile. The second Gentile we're going to find in Cornelius, Acts 11, 43. Uh, in Acts 11... Uh, see, there's no such thing as Acts 11:43. There's uh, Acts uh, should be Acts 10, perhaps 43. Yes. Here is Peter preaching to Cornelius the Gentile. And he was preaching. God had sent, as you remember, to get to fetch uh, Peter to preach to him because an angel cannot preach the gospel of grace. The angels were there, but they can't preach the gospel of grace. Man is the only one that can preach gospel of grace. And uh, he's preaching to, Gent to Cornelius in verse 43, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. Now, I want you to notice he doesn't use the word baptize because Cornelius is a full-blooded Gentile. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. I want you to notice the gospel of grace is pre being preached. Now, the clearest uh, gospel of grace for Gentile before the church turned Gentile, the early church was Jewish, is found in Acts chapter 16, verse 30. This is the Philippian jailer. Acts 16, 37, the Philippian jailer said uh, in verse 30, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a simple question. It deserves a simple answer. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the words of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour that night and washed their stripes and was baptized he and all his straightway. That's your gospel of grace being preached to a Gentile. Now I've had uh, so many people over the years get they cannot part repentance, you see, from grace or from the gospel of grace. They've got to get it into the church and have a Gentile repent before he can be saved. That's a conjunction. God says we have to leave them apart. 
Repentance is a word that's used after you're saved. <laughs> you can only repent after you believe because if you repented first, it would be a work. <laughs> all right, now I'm going to show you a verse that will help Hopefully that will nail it all down, you know, and make it neat for you. Turn with me to Acts 20 and 21. Here is Paul, his farewell to the Ephesians. In verse 21 he says, uh, well I'll start in verse 20, And now I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me make that a little bit clearer by uh, reading it again. I'm going to change it a little bit and hopefully it will dawn on you what he's saying. Testifying both to the Jews, repentance towards God, and also to the Greeks, faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. So you have two groups in there, Jews and Gentiles, and you have two ways of salvation. One, repentance toward God, and two, faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. The Jew, of course, had to believe before he could repent, but he had to repent. The Gentile just exercised faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no repentance in order for him to be saved. All right. Now, the Jews, God gave them 40 years probationary period for the nation of Israel to come to God in repentance, but they didn't and they lost the kingdom. That is the spiritual orb of the kingdom. There's two orbs of the kingdom, the spiritual orb and the earthly orb. They could not lose the earthly orb. That's theirs by virtue of, of uh, the covenant given to Abraham, which is an unconditional covenant. That's the same as their heaven. <laughs> the church is, has a spiritual orb, and there is a spiritual orb to the kingdom. There are going to be those on the earth in the physical orb that will be in the kingdom. There are going to be those in 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 the spiritual orb of the kingdom. All right, in Acts 28, 28, after God finally said, I've had enough with these people, that is the Jews, he said, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. This is a the rightly dividing now between the Jews and the Gentiles. From this point on, there is no more signs or wonders that's going to be, uh, you know, done. There's going to be a lot of changes here. But the main message of the Bible from this point on will be, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Father, thank you for the hour. Uh, we pray that you dismiss us now bless all these things that uh, these truths that we've seen together so that we can rightly divide your word and understand what you're saying to us dismiss us in your love in jesus name we pray